And we're recording, Andy, so you can go ahead and begin. Okay, well, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's two o'clock, and it's uh, November 23rd, and this is a meeting of the Finance Committee, which I am now calling to order. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via a remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, I'm gonna begin by um, just checking in with each member of the committee to make sure that you can hear me and be heard. And then uh, we will uh, go on to, uh, the agenda and um, I, I'll um, see if we wanna talk about the agenda or change the order um, after, but let's start with the first part. So, uh, Pat D'Angelis. Present. And Lynn Greaser. Present. Bob Hegner. Here. Matt Holloway. Holloway. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Dorothy Pam. I'm here. here? Uh, I'm present. I'm having to answer the doorbell and pay somebody who did some, some work for me. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, Kathy uh, Shane. Here. Okay. So, uh, and I'm here. So that makes all of us. Uh, and uh, Athena, uh, are you the minute taker today or is uh, we, are we getting Bill back today? No, Bill's on vacation. So I'll stick with you today. Okay, well, we'll try and make this as expeditious as possible. Um, I guess I need to check or have somebody check to see if we have anybody in the audience at this point. It does not appear so, so there's no reason to call for public comment. Uh, what um, I think our main order of business and what I would propose to start with first is the um, council guidelines draft. And then uh, I think that we have two items that we placed on the agenda um, afterwards, just in case we wanted to have further discussion about them. Uh, and I put them down as performance shell, uh, the maintenance fund and the ARPA fund proposal. And, uh, Sean can talk about the status of each as we get to it, um, or I can uh, plug in a little bit too. Um, Andy Lynn and has her hand up. Yeah, Lynn? It's for later. Okay. And the last thing that I was going to just tell you, and then we'll come back to it later, is when we get to next meetings, uh, there's one issue that I'm going to bring up under next meetings just to advise you about um, as, a, as our next meet, as one of our next meeting agenda items. Uh, but it's, it can't be discussed today in any significance because it wasn't posted. So um, since we have no public comment, we'll get on to the um, most important task of the day, which is the uh, council budget guidelines. Is that what you're asking? Are you raising your hand about, Lynn? Um, yes, but before that, Andy, are we not going to look at the reorganization issues. The reorganization meaning the, the two reorganization council. proposals. I'm guessing For some reason oh, I I, yes. Um, we didn't post that into the agenda. Okay. And actually Sean and I talked about that um or it's by email earlier in the day to try and figure that out. And uh, because it didn't come up, uh, this was where we uh, sort of came to, um, and I'll just go ahead and finish out the thought now rather than postpone it for later since Lynn raised it. And what she's talking about is that um, the town manager is proposed, as you know, and it's referenced in the, we talked about it a little bit last week, but, uh, didn't uh, really get into the depth of it, which is the creation of two new departments, um, Cress and um, uh, 
is a DEI. Uh, and uh, the um, question in the way it was referred from the council is it was referred to two committees, principally referred to uh, town services and operations TSO, or town services and um, outreach, which is TSO, of which I'm, that's my other committee. Most of us serve on two committees, and that's my other committee. And the other um, mm -hmm. uh, committee was referred to us for only the question of financial impact. Um, and uh, the uh, the way we had uh, it was discussed at the council meeting. I'm not sure it was part of the motion, but certainly it was part of the discussion. Was is that we would report to TSO, and then TSO would do a single report for the entire process. Um, TSO has scheduled a public forum on this for December nine, and uh, we. Uh, uh, I think that it's actually a part of the uh, charter requirement that it's required to be a public, there has to be a public forum. And so that that was um, referred off to the committee, uh, the TSO committee. Um, TSO um, is asking that we have uh, any financial impact statement available by December 9 and um, so that it can be available for the public forum. So uh, if we don't meet again till December 7, it would be a, it would be a December 7 agenda item. Um, if there is uh, if we decided it's better to have another meeting earlier, which we'll come to at the end of this discussion when we see where we are with the uh, guidelines, um, then we can, uh, uh, we'll have two choices. But that's kind of um, summarizes it. Lynn, is there anything else you wanna add? No, you answered my question on that one. But Sean, Sean has his hand up, I think. Yeah, I know, Sean. Andy, would it be okay if, either during or after this meeting, I send the reorg plans out to everybody if they don't have them and ask if they could send questions to me um, and, and copy you. And then that way I can um, I can make sure when we do discuss it that we address um, whatever questions there are on the front end. That would I think be that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Sean. Yep. So any other preliminary questions? If not, um, so the uh, guidelines, uh, we ran into a little bit of a snag and it's just the way things went. Originally, the, um, I had hoped that I would be able to work very closely with uh, Kathy and uh, Bob on uh, a draft, but um, it turned out that after, um, Athena and I looked at the open meeting law, we agreed that um, it was under the open meeting law, a subcommittee. And um, as a subcommittee, it would have required that we have posted meetings and um, that uh, the uh, discussion be a posted meeting, which ran into a couple of problems. One was is that um, as you've gathered, it, uh, this turned out to be, a lot more of a project than I anticipated and uh, with a lot going on on top of it uh, that was other council stuff that was unrelated to finance. So um, it, and the scheduling of a meeting and doing it as a meeting made it very difficult. So I was not able to use that process. Um, so I'm the owner of and all, all the criticisms that will be heard hurled, uh, which is fine, because uh, you can't really throw anything at me. Um, but um, what I attempted to do uh, and finally finished last night with the last of the drafts, uh, when it finally turned into what's now draft three, which is my uh, markings to keep them straight as I work through them, uh, is I 
use the uh, prior year's uh, guidelines. And then I did both substantial reorganization uh, as well as updating contact, content because there was uh, a lot of sections that were kind of repetitive of each other. And I tried to uh, narrow it down so that I could get rid of um, a lot of the repetition where things would be brought up and then repeated again in later sections uh, simply because there were too many sections. So that's where we I ended up. And uh, what I would suggest is that we do it section at a time and just uh, get comments and try and stick to uh, the substantive issues that you may see in the guidelines and you made note of. If you have things that are more in the nature of Scrivener errors or just suggestions on grammatical changes, uh, they could be emailed to me and uh, it would make um, uh, for a more interesting meeting to, to stick with the major topics. So that's my proposal of how to deal with uh, what we're going to do next. I see Lynn's hand is still up. I, Lynn, were you going to add to it or is that from before? I'm going to start by saying thank you, Andy, for taking a first stab at a very, very difficult uh, item to write. Uh, I think um, it's amazing how you can pull it all together. And I also want to recognize Sean and Sonia for providing, for providing us with, along with Paul, the financial indicators presentation that could be drawn upon at this early stage as we go forward. Other than that, I just would like to just set a different tone to how we go after things. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, oh, and the last thing I will note, and I think I was in my cover email, is that um, last year, uh, either Sean or Sonia, I can't remember who, um, provided the last two pages, which became attached. And I think that in the final version, uh, it went through uh, Angela up in the town manager's office because she has the skills to put those kinds of things together. And uh, I so um, you should note that while it's, it got attached again, um, as a reminder, uh, we do need to go through that process to get the right charts attached to the final document. Uh, so any other preliminary comments? Otherwise, I, my suggestion is that we start by section. Kathy. I want to echo Lynn's thanks for this and Sean. And I have just as we go through sections, I have a question for people to think about. So I'm not sure it's even a recommendation, but because it's a fairly long document with some ideas that are either new or uh, noteworthy to highlight, I'm wondering if we, we've never done it before um, at the very beginning of the introduction saying some things that are notable in this year's guidelines uh, that we discuss in the committee are as follows, just bullet, 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 bullet to, to draw people's attention. You know, the text below discusses these things. So it's just a thought. And so as we go through this, I have some specifics that would be examples of that. So it's some of what we talked about last week um, you know, as an example, the multi-year um, showing of operating, um, you know, a couple other things. So it's not a lot, but it just, it would, it would be a way of highlighting that this isn't your, uh, read the first page and it's going to be just what the indicators were that came to us, um, you know, from staff. So it's something to think about as a, a, a formatting idea. That's it. Okay. So are you proposing that 
as you identify those items in each section by section, we would uh, highlight them then. This is one to add to the. Yeah, I think that's one way of doing it. You know, so for example, the fact that the um, town has received a higher percentage increase. Um, and we endorse this for the following reasons, or later we say we're going back up to 10% and we think that's important. Um, the point about uh, not drawing on uh, the uh, stabilization fund for ongoing costs. So there are just a few, you know, in terms of recommendations from the finance committee to the manager. So it's the that's a and so I'm not looking at a page worth of these, but it may not work because there may be too many. You know, I'm not trying to add to it. So I find as a reader, if I'm a busy reader, that helps me focus on um, a particular area. So it's a it's a style question as we go through. So exactly, Andy. So if we don't have that many of them and there are only a few, it might make it easier. If there are too many of them, it may be that people have to just read through sentence by sentence. Okay, well, maybe what we should do, I'm actually reaching my drawer to pull out a highlighter because uh, I'm working off of a paper copy in the old fashioned sense. So it's easier than uh, for me right now. Uh, but uh, what I'll We'll identify them as we go through the document, and then we'll see what they are and how many. Because I think we'll, if we don't find them in the document, then we got a problem because they don't exist. There's nothing to cite to. Uh, and uh, the first two paragraphs are pretty much pro forma, so I'm, I'm going to assume that there was nothing in there. And if nobody's uh, saying anything about the first two paragraphs, um, as I did last year, I started with uh, the overall philosophy and concerns section. Lynn? You're muted. You're still Lynn, you're muted. muted. to look at two screens at once and haven't perfected Athena's talent for that. Um, uh, I wondered under the second paragraph where we talk about the Amherst, Town of Amherst financial management policy and objectives adopted January 2008 and updated in 2021, whether we should say by the finance committee working with a finance director. Yeah, actually, the thing is, we haven't updated, we haven't accepted the updated policy yet, actually. Okay. That got raised, I think, by uh, to Matt, who, who raised it as, as a question. Uh, <clears throat> so we probably need to eliminate the updated for now, because that's actually on its, the to-do list of things that this committee needs to either finish up or pass on to the next council. And uh, uh, just so you know, uh, uh, as you all recall, we talked about it, I think on September 29 meeting and uh, went through it section by section. And Sean was going to see if there were any final edits that he wanted to tell us about and uh, then we and allow us to just finish it up. And uh, the, I, I was going to uh, ask whether we wanted to do that at, at, at our next meeting or whether we wanted to put it on our list of tasks for the next committee. So um, let me just reflect on that for one moment and just say, that's why I brought this up because I don't remember us voting and I know it didn't come to the council. So, and the word policy to me says it has to come to the council. Um, it, part of me says, I would just as soon mop up this kind of stuff before the new council is brought on. Um, but therefore, and having said that, um, you know, everybody's already screaming about agendas. Uh, but if we can do this and put it on the agenda for the 6th and then vote on it on the 13th, that would work. 
Okay. Um, this says, uh, because we didn't put the big issue of uh, transfer memo onto the next, uh, onto this agenda, because we wanted to get through this item. Mm -hmm. um, it really has to be a next meeting right. discussion. Um, yeah, and Andy, my memory is that other than Sean making sure we've got the wording right, this we we all agreed on the substantive changes. So I think it's, I don't think it's going to require a lot of time in the finance committee to get to what I would call ready for the council to see it. Um, if Sean had Sean and Sonia have the time, you know, to put their blessings on it. Um, Sean. Yeah, I mean, we can send, um, I've got a review of final clean version with Paul, but then we could set it out ahead of time so people could read it and come to the that first meeting with comments. Um, what date were you thinking, Lynn? Or did you throw out there? I would prefer to have it on the December 6th okay. council agenda. Council and, agenda. Because it's going to need to be probably on both. This is the first time anybody's seen it. If people are willing to vote on it, on the sixth, that'd be fabulous. But yeah, so it has to have a second reading. It has to go to the thirteenth. So I think when we discussed this last time, um, I thought we were headed down the path that we weren't. It wasn't something that was going to be voted or adopted by the council. That they were really sort of the town managers. Um, that under the new form of government, they they are the town managers' procedures, and that this process was more about um, sort of getting the finance committee's guidance and and blessing of them, but not necessarily adopting them. Um, but that's something we should circle back with the town manager to see if he feels the same way. Um, and, and in that case, all it would need is a financial finance committee report attached to the document, and it can be an information piece. Yeah. We, have, we have different committees of the council who have, quote, policies. I call them guidelines because the word policies to me suggests adopted at a higher level. Right. Um, and, but they have different operating mechanisms under which they work. Okay. And so yeah. I'll, I'll I, follow up with Paul and I'll send that out to you all. And um, I don't, I mean, if we, so if we shoot for the six though, we won't have, unless we meet again, if, unless we schedule another meeting for next week, um, we won't have time to review it at this body. Are we already scheduled for the 30th? No, that was the yeah, end of the back to that, you discussed okay. that at the end under next meetings. It is difficult, and I sort of hate to go here because it's again, you're getting into the substance we were hoping to avoid. But, um, you know, the policy issues such as um, that the um, amount that we want to accumulate the free cash is 5% and above 5% goes to into stabilization funds and the, the goal is to have total reserves between five and 15 percent and you know what what is that a um, council policy kind of question or is it a town manager management kind of question so that um, you know the the, the the prior version uh which I uh, drafted when I was a teenager and in the younger in a different lifetime um, with uh, with the with the then finance committee, you know, we just put it all together in one document. So I don't know how we want to handle that. Um, Dorothy, you have your hand up. We were talking about overall philosophy and concerns twenty three. Okay. So um, I put my hand up because it takes a while, but um, my questions are paragraphs five, six, seven, and eight, um, down to the end of that section. Um, and the repetition of the words evaluate, evaluate, assess. And so my questions are, and also enhance efficiency and effectiveness. So either we say we're gonna do it or we do it. And if we do it, that first question is, Where's the additional staff? Because we've talked about this, but obviously it must be hard work to do. Um, enhancing efficiency and effectiveness sounds like something that's been getting us in trouble. 
piling more work on staff on top of their regular duties, maybe increasing staff quitting um, or staff reduction. I mean, you know, I lived for years in New York City during the budget crisis. This was all we ever did. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but I, I just wanna know how real is this and how's it gonna be done really? That's it. So why don't you pick out, you said uh, you named some paragraphs, five, six, seven. Pick out one sentence that is an example for us and then let's focus on that for a second. If you if you are muted, so if you're trying to report to us, yeah, sorry. Paragraph six. However, we, the second sentence. However, we should continually seek improvements to enhance efficiency and effectiveness. We also need to evaluate those services, the need for them, the town's capacity to support them, and their consistency with community values, as well as sustainability and social justice equity goals adopted by the town council. Now, here I do have to second what Lynn said. Uh, that's a really good sentence, okay? But, you know, that's, as I say, how we lived for a long time. And it generally means people working more with no raises and um, or hiring new people. And I, I, I know we have a problem of a lot of work. Um, and everybody talks about, you know, the lean and mean uh, way of doing things that, that, that led to a lot of people losing jobs. Um, and you do cut down on that. So I just, I just wanna know, do we, are we really gonna do this and how are we gonna do it and keep our staff and actually find out something that, can, that we can do? This is what people say they're gonna do, but to do it is hard, very hard. Yeah, let me just point out um, and then continue to get thoughts and maybe Sean and Sonia will um, respond to this too. This was actually a paragraph I think that was copied from prior years and not changed much um, because we sort of felt that continual assessment of operations was something that we thought just management should do. So we've just sort of been there, but I've not sure thought that we went back and look to see what was done is sort of just putting it out there. Yeah, Andy, I'll just quickly add to that. I think the messaging is good. Um, I don't think, I mean, when I look at this, I don't necessarily view this as um, reducing staff, but I think it's sort of reevaluating processes that maybe we haven't kind of thought through in a while and think about if there's um, more efficient ways to do it. Um, and I think we do that all the time as staff, like whether it's using technology or, um, or just kind of rebuilding processes to be more efficient and with the primary goal to give us more time to take on the other things that the, um, the council and the town manager want us to do. So I think it, um, I see Dorothy's point, um, but I, I don't look at it that way. I look at it more as how do we just try to use technology and other things to be more efficient so that we can um, have more time for um, higher priority initiatives. Thank you. Matt. I think it's a, an effective sort of, um, as Sean said, kind of just setting the, the foundation of the document. So I, I think it's effective, but I agree with Dorothy that, you know, since this is a, a, a year where we're kind of talking about transitioning from um, an existing body of services into hopefully, you know, covering some of those costs, the, the CREST and um, equity costs out of existing programs that Maybe that sentence that Dorothy read could um, uh, say something along the lines of, you know, we also need to evaluate those services, um, town's capacity, and their consistency with community values, um, as well as transitioning into addition, you know, um, transitioning into additional departments and services pursuant to the social justice equity goals adopted by the council. Something to indicate the transitional nature of things because I, I think that that is sort of the challenge of this document. It, one of the big challenges is, is incorporating those two new departments.
Okay. Um, can work on that. And uh, this one, what I'm going to do this time is if I feel like there's a particular individual, like in this case, Matt, who's raised a question, I'm not going to try and create any subcommittee, but I will consult individual members of the committee um, to make sure I got the wording that they were thinking or with their help on getting the wording. Uh, Lynn? Yes, yeah, so let me give you a take on efficiency. When the CREST program first started being talked about, okay, they wanted to have their own call center, which would be directly duplicative of the one that we already have at the police station that takes care of fire and EMS. And so they actually went and visited the existing call center. And lo and behold, they decided it actually could handle what they want. Um, I think as we go forward, we may find that there are other efficiencies with the CREST program or any other program based on some of those kinds of explorations and based on what we learn as we evaluate the effectiveness of these programs and the financial feasibility. So for example, in other local towns that have already tried to come up with an alternative or complementary uh, response mechanism to police, they basically have hired people with uh, that are not uniformed, but part of the police department. And um, right now, the way we are funding CRESS will be as a standalone unit, uh, because that's the way they have proposed that it be. So I think we have to be open to efficiencies. And my example of the call center is an example of where those efficiencies actually have already been realized. Mm -hmm. John? One, one quick thing, and Sonia will kill me if I don't say it, is, um, and maybe this is for Matt when he's writing the sentence to consider, is that also to acknowledge that there's sort of a growing um, workload for a lot of staff too. Um, you know, whether it be changing laws or new programs, um, new permit types, you know, the things are just constantly growing, they're never shrinking. Um, and so we, so we do want to be more efficient, but a lot of times that's just sort of soaked up with all the new things that have come up, um, whether it be cannabis or all the, all the new programs you can think of that have popped up in the last five years. I'm going to build on that by saying all we keep hearing about is fire and EMS. We're down five police. We're down in any number of other departments. People are not feeling good about their jobs because they're just overworked. And yet last night, when I brought up the idea of a comprehensive staff study and salary study, it's like I was speaking with fork tongues. Yeah. yeah, I I don't know how we um, address this other than a few sentences, but that's my sense, Lynn, also on the overworked. Um, uh, Sean and Sonia will know more about whatever happened uh, with within their department with a procurement officer who had been terrific for years. And I think we, we have been burning people out because we have a lot of extra meetings they're going to and extra responsibilities um, beyond an already demanding job. So I don't know how we get a good assessment of that. And uh, one of our successes of going through COVID is how tight our budgets have been able to be. But we are seeing we are seeing the impact of it. Um, you know, as in my other life as uh, more of an economist, economist. Someone said there's only so many efficiencies you can get with an orchestra. You know, it's it's people um, and, you know, it's there are a certain number of them need to do certain kinds of things. Um, so it is 
you know, where we can, we should, um, but trying to get some sense either of, are we too many meetings, too many duplicative meetings, those kinds of things we can address, but day-to-day -day jobs that have tasks that have to be done um, is more difficult. Um, so I, I, I think looking for that, and that's why this, when we get to look at the reorganization plan, um, I think we need to, when possible, think of teams. Um, not everything can be separate groups doing somewhat similar things on in uh, health and safety. So that, that's a different discussion, but we should avoid it if we can avoid it. Um, Uh, Bernie? Yeah, just um, if we want staff to have um, the ability to brainstorm and to consider different efficiencies and new ways of doing things, and we really have to be explicit about that and give them the time to do it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, and all too often, any kind of reasonable discussion about future work or planning or new efficiencies gets overcome by events. That's been my experience in human services as a, with the Commonwealth. It's been my experience as managing three communities. Um, so I think we need to be, um, I'm frankly concerned that we are um, overworked. I think um, we're likely to see the, uh, the, the turnover in new hires has been part of that. Um, positions just sort of disappearing, I think has been part of that. Um, and so there's some some real concern here, and it's not that we have people who are making. Uh, we have very very competent people. We have very good staff, um, and they're being stretched too thin. So that's the. Uh, I'll step off my soapbox now. Yeah, actually, though, it ties to the last comment, and so it's a question of whether it should be explicitly called out because. One was uh, expressed as need time to do it, and the other was overworked. It kind of tie together a little bit, and maybe that needs to be incorporated into this thought too. Dorothy? Well, I'll just say my experience of being one of the people who returned in person to HCC. First of all, most didn't want to. Um, they reduced our class size. We did not increase it, okay? So I now the class size went from 32 to 15. Um, and we're working very, very hard in doing what we're doing. Um, there's just, we also discovered that technology was not our savior. That yes, there's some classes that are taught well remotely online, but that most students needed and wanted in-person teaching. So I am kind of skeptical about technology as being the savior in terms of efficiency. I know that you've done a lot of great things with technology in the town, but I think we need people and we need more inspection staff. We, we, we need more people. And I would love it if we had more young hires so that there's a little depth in the field because some of the people that have turned over had, it was normal retirement. Maybe they decided this was a good time to retire, okay, because of, of all the things that was going on. But many of them had been I think we had a lot of 30 year people and even more that retired. So I, I really want to see more people and young people coming in and, and working for the town. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but they will come in at lower salaries. So that's one positive. Said belong in the financial budget guidelines. Either they are in the goals or both. Uh, I'm going to build on one more thing, uh, and that is the issue of salaries and who do we compete with. And uh, when we look at the people that left, at least two left, one for another town for 50,000 more, one for the other another public sector job for 50,000 more. And others have gone to the private sector. So my suggestion is we don't longer we no longer just compete with other towns. We compete with the private sector for our engineers. And we need to look at the salary issues as based on who do we compete with. And that is a financial issue. And so 
when you do a comprehensive look at staffing and efficiency, you have to also add into it how do we who do we compete with and what do our salaries need to be? Okay. Well, let's see if we can try and beef up this string of thoughts that we have here and go on to another section unless somebody has last thought about um, section that we've just been on about philosophy, budget philosophy, Bernie. You're muted. Trying to put my hand down and unmute myself at the same time, it doesn't work. Um, in the, the paragraph that begins, we support the creation of the community responders for equity, safety, services, uh, which will reduce the demand on the police department over time. I would just modify that sentence to say it may reduce the demand for police staffing. There's no guarantee that we're going to end up with a smaller, leaner um, Amherst PD if once we implement a community responder program. So it may. And I'm, I'm happy to see that the, the budget, at least for the community responder piece that was in the Committee's reports essentially been tossed out um, because it was there were some serious errors in there and some um, some other mistakes. There's some mistakes in there, I think. Um, so just I, I would just soften that a little bit to say it may reduce because we don't know until we get the leaps data and we actually put something in place. We ain't gonna know. Yeah, no, it's a point that we sort of say it elsewhere, but it's good to call it out in that sentence. Thank you. Anything else? Otherwise, uh, should we should go into the revenue projection section. See if there's any comments there. Matt? So my, my comment is for the the last paragraph of this revenue section. So if folks want to speak to things that come earlier, I can I can wait, Andy. Dorothy, keep your hand up and I'll get circled back. Dorothy. Um, often our revenue projections have been actually quite conservative, which I like. Um, the opposite of, of, of a more political response, which always pretends it's going to be better than it is. So I just wanted to check with Sean and uh, Sonia, um, is this in your tradition of being rather conservative about your predictions? I would say it's consistent with how we've done things in the past. I would, um, I would push back a little bit that we're overly conservative. Sonia and I looked at the last 10, 12 years of revenue surpluses, expense surpluses, and on both the revenue side and the expense side, we're generally about 99% of what we our target was. Um, you know, we have somewhere between a 1% and a 1.5% margin of error. Um, when you add those together, um, both the revenue surplus and, and the savings on the expense side, you get to two or 3%, but both individually revenues and expenses were pretty close to about 99% each year. So. I feel like that's a pretty healthy target and where we want to uh, stay in that range. Um, I can't imagine what we would do to sharpen it up beyond 99% without being overly um, optimistic. And as Sonia will tell you, she's been here longer than I, every year is different. There's not like a year where it's the same thing consistently coming in um, under budget or revenues coming in over target. It changes year to year. So I think we are conservative, but I would say when you look at the the data, you know, the last few years being a little bit um, of an anomaly because of COVID, um, but the years before that, pretty consistently around 99% on both expenses and revenues. Um, yeah, uh, somewhere in this power in this section, um, I actually, I associated it with the third paragraph, I guess. Uh, I felt like we needed to say something about inflation or the threat of inflation eating up our gains. I, I know on Saturday at the Four Towns meeting, Andy, we mentioned that, and we've all seen some pretty concerning inflation stuff going on right now. 
Good point. Matt, we're circling back to you. Okay. Um, well, I have the ARPA presentation in the back of my mind when I look at this, and uh, especially sort of the um, stimulation, stimulate, revitalize uh, some of those efforts that you know Sean and Paul and and um, their team are are trying to lead with ARPA and especially the economic empowerment work. Um, and I just think this, you know, the analysis is good and, and definitely reflects a lot of what we've heard from, you know, from them. Um, and I would, I would, I guess, encourage maybe us to consider if we want to, you know, further encourage these efforts towards right revitalization, stimulation of the um, of the downtown economy you know, around. Um, one one question I had that I forgot to ask previously was, you know, that that 16% increase in local receipts. I mean, you know, how does that compare to our neighbors? How does that compare to the broader economic uh, forecast? You know, and and so I guess maybe just I was just thinking something to sort of goose the, you know, goose the energy around revitalization and, and to indicate our support for that work or 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 not. I mean, I guess that's that's, a, that's more of a question than a flat statement, but I, I just thought that might be an area to to target um, that work. Sure. Yeah, I agree with I agree with Matt. I think adding something about economic development and and maybe even noting that position since it was proposed and um, we plan to move forward with it makes sense. Um, the 16.2%, I don't know how our neighbors are in that range. I will say this is not the normal increase for local receipts. This is because we cut it during the pandemic. And so this is, I think communities are probably gonna have a little bit of an uneven path back to where they were pre-pandemic. Um, but for us, this is a much larger increase than normal. Um, and then I did have a comment on the same section. I just wanted to quickly say, there's the sentence about um, projected FY23 revenue from local receipts being less than the amount received in FY21. Um, I just wanted to note the reason why that is, is because in FY21, there are a number of sort of one-time revenues that we receive that are not things we can budget for every year. Um, the things that we can budget for every year, we're at that level or higher um, looking forward, but there were some things around um, some supplemental uh, tax revenue that is not an every year thing. And then the other thing that's in FY21 that we just haven't budgeted yet, and this is another thing that this committee may want to discuss, is um, cannabis impact fees. So in FY21, there's about $200,000 of cannabis impact fees. FY23, we haven't budgeted it yet. It's something that we need more conversation about what we can use those funds for, what we want to use those funds for, um, because they're they're limited in their, in their use. So would you uh, suggest we eliminate that piece that says yet we know that projected FY23 revenue from your is actually less than received in 21. Just knock that out entirely. Yeah, either knock it out or explain why. I just don't want people to think that we're budgeting less than we received in FY21 without a, a reason for it, so. Okay. So I'm looking don't see any other hands up right now. Just finish writing. I'm trying to write neatly enough so that I can remember what I wrote later. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I don't want to get into it like we did last night, but at some point, um, we clearly need to resolve the relationship of BCG and who is the relationship to, who do they recommend to, and how that fits with what we do and the town council. So we get into that uh, at some point in here. I might- Yeah, I'll keep an eye on that because yeah. I think that probably belongs in a later section towards the end. Yes. I don't think it belongs in revenue or expenditures as a, right. in particular. Uh, anything else? Otherwise, I'm going to go on to um, expenditures. And uh, I mean, what I, and I guess obviously uh, it needs to be renumbered. I realize that because uh, three is repeated twice, but um, the breakout of expenditures and expenses for operations and expenses for capital. 
for like three successive sections. So if you're, if anybody wants to criticize that or comment on that, they should do so as we go along. Otherwise, um, also just jump into the first, first of the numbered three, currently numbered three. Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question on the, the second paragraph talking about the size of the stabilization fund and, you know, the sense of the supporting the major capital expenses. The last time I looked at the model that we have it was a year or two ago, and the size of the stabilization fund has changed. The costs have probably changed. Sean, do we have an update on terms of like, is that model still kind of more or less good the way it is, or do we have to update it and be a little more refined about you know what we have in terms of stabilization fund, what the costs are likely to be going forward? Um, good question. I think our reserve situation hasn't changed all that much. It's gotten better, but it was good to begin with. So I don't think that's noticeably different. Um, I don't think interest rates have changed all that much. I think the next big update will be when we have schematic designs for DPW and fire. Um, and we see what those figures are and what we can get forward and if there's going to be any um, shifting of, of numbers there. Um, I think that's probably the really big uh, next step for us, um, which hopefully we'll have in the next year or so. Okay, thanks. Kathy? I'm just unmuting. Um, I, I have a question on the organization on this. Um, starting, since we know one of the issues in, from the indicator meeting is the operating budgets, starting with the four major buildings doesn't feel to me quite right on expenditures. I understand why it's here because um, it makes the case that we can't, it makes a strong case that we can't just dip into the stabilization fund. We've built it up. So, um, and then we, that's capital. So this section is all to me is capital. Then we do operating, then we do capital later you know, the way it's set up right now. So on page, uh, well, people can find the page, but rule number four is expenses for capital, the, the two threes. So I didn't know whether anyone else has that reaction to it. And I don't have a, a big suggestion. It might be one way of handling it might be to have that first statement just be, we have built up a stabilization fund because we know we've got some draws on it that we're gonna have in the future. We discuss this more later under capital and then move it, but get quickly to operating budgets. Otherwise, it looks to me that we're more, that there's a priority around the, the building projects as opposed to the operating budgets, um, you know, and, Two years ago, we had to do we had to cut this expenditure to pr protect the operating budget. So it's it's just a comment. I don't really have specific words within this that I would change. It's more I'm not sure it's located in the right place, and I would just do something quick so we could get to the controversial point. Um, you know that, and that I'll stop. I think I think I was clear, but maybe not. You know that. We want to move to 10%. We want to protect the thing. But now we're going to go into operate and we're going to talk more about capital later. Um, so we don't put so much emphasis on the buildings. And I'll just say the one more thing. When Sean gave us the plan that allowed for in, um, he, we asked for a plan and they gave us a plan. And the first thing I saw is extremely tight operating budgets for a number of years. And we've just talked about the consequence of really tight operating budgets is what's happening underneath them to people. Um, and so operating budgets that go back to two and a half percent increase with health insurance going up, pensions going up, step increases and COLA things don't, uh, they're still very tight. <laughs> I'll just say that that's a tight budget. So I just, just Kathy, can I just quickly just add the, that was just the balance. Yeah. yeah. 
Kathy, that was before we added Cress or, or additional EMS staff too. Just right, that was, <laughs> that was, that's what, before we said, oh, and while we're doing it, let's add 10 or 11 more people yeah. to the budget and grab some funds that short term help us get over that. But it's not clear to me where that leaves us in 2026. So then you're saying, well, big buildings, yes, schematic design and stuff, but I think we're on a collision tosh course on some of these that we will have to make some hard decisions and I'm not sure we could work them down. So all of this was to say, I didn't wanna lead just with four buildings as if that's a done deal, we fix that one and now we're getting on to operating. That's it. Yeah, of course, when you're trying to do the, the separate expenditure section to talk about sort of the big picture issues of expenditures before getting into the specifics and operations. I mean, it's kind of where it comes from. And I guess the other thing I'll note is that in the certainly jump in to respond to this and not trying to be defensive at all in what I wrote. The decision to um, start building up reserves and pay down old capital um, really dates back to Sandy Pooler in anticipation of the four building projects. Um, and so it was kind of in a policy in place for a while because it took a while to build those reserves to the level that they are. Uh, but it was obviously done for a purpose. And if you then change the purpose to say, okay, we're gonna use the reserves to fund the CREST program, then uh, it sort of disrupts this assumption that has been made when building them up. Yeah, I didn't mean if if that's what I said came across that way. I didn't mean that, Andy. I meant a shorter section to say we built up reserves for a particular reason. We're moving to ten percent, and for a longer discussion on capital, see below, so that we could get. So that's all. I I wasn't. I think those are good decisions, and we should stand by them. I ju I just found it. This is capital in uh, almost a full page. Then a little while later, we get to capital again, the kind of other capital. <laughs> so it's if it doesn't bother anyone else, I'm fine with the way it's organized. I can uh, try something better. As you know, uh, well, actually I've been playing around with where to put the bulk of the capital and they're trying to make sure that I get the bulk of the capital in the capital. Because uh, I think we had that problem in prior years too. Matt? I think it's um, an organizational note or, or idea that kind of, I don't know if it builds on Kathy or is just sort of inspired by what she's maybe what I what I hear her to be saying, but but on page um, five towards the bottom, um, there's a paragraph that starts. The council recognizes that revenue is insufficient to meet these needs, which you know it kind of speaks to that to that same point. And um, you know, I think if there were going to be any guidance in terms of um, compromises to be made on this very you know ambitious. Uh, and agenda slash sort of you know two new departments four major projects and all that. I mean I think that 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 would be the place where you know your final. I mean I think your final sentence is, is really strong, Andy. Um, we recognize making progress on multiple fronts that require investments will not be achieved in a single year. You know, and I think I'm not necessarily saying pluck that out and put it at the front of the section, but but I do think that that sort of pragmatic, realistic. Um, Messaging should live towards the front, um, just given how ambitious this overall scope of, of um, work is. Other thoughts? So I'm looking for that sentence that you were referring to, Matt. Is it on page five or? Yeah, uh, just you have expenses for capital on the bottom of page five, and then three paragraphs up from that, the council recognizes the revenue is insufficient. Yep. 
Could you move that higher? Is that what you're thinking? I might I might move that higher if you're going to do a reorganization the way that I think you know Kathy's kind of suggesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that unfortunately that may be one of the central points of this of this whole document is you know that we're not going to accomplish all all these goals in in a year, and that um, you know to what degree do you turn over to the town manager's team, you know, some of these decisions versus what does the council want to guide on in terms of, um, you know, tough, tough decisions. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about it's a, the first full paragraph on page five. It's the one just above what what Matt was talking about. And we, we hear we were we we recommend that the that the manager you know consider a multi-year projection of operating budgets for the town i i i have a sense or my my concern is it's not just the town we have to worry about over the next three or four years i think it's every aspect of the budget it's the 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 library and the the debt service it's the schools, the elementary schools, and it's the regional schools. And we have a big transition in the elementary schools into the middle school building. And all that's gonna cost money. Um, and I think maybe this is the time that we, even though this, the school budget isn't quite our purview, but maybe we make the recommendation that the town really sit down and do a multi-year budget, uh, at least over the next two or three years, so we we don't wind up falling off a cliff somewhere, and I, I recognize this is extra work, you know, per the com the conversation we had before, but I'm I'm very concerned that we're we're going to wind up falling off a cliff somewhere because we haven't really thought through, well, how are we going to pay for all these various things? And what's it going to look like when we put it all together? Andy, can I just respond to that real quickly? Yeah, and then I'll, then I'll call Dorothy, but go ahead. So we do multi-year budgeting. Um, we did a five-year budget that's in the budget document itself. Um, I think what you're looking for, Bob, is a more detailed breakdown of within like the town operating budget and within the school budget. Um, and so those are things we're working on now. I mean, we do them, but um, you know, I think it was July, June, late June, when the council voted to um, to to staff, I think 10, 10 people for the community responder program. Um, and so, you know, these are things that we plan on doing or we're doing now and we plan on sharing with the um, this committee at some point in the future is those detailed, um, more detailed projections of the next few years that look at the, our budgets. And I think I don't think we're going to fall off a cliff. I think we have strong reserves. We have strong communication and planning. I do agree that it's going to require tough decisions. I think that was always um, something we were going to have to do when we're adding significant um, significant staff to a budget that we already sort of max out that it's going to require difficult decision making. So I do agree with difficult decisions. I don't think we're going to hit a cliff. Again, we, we look forward. We're not going to um, drop surprises on people. Um, and our budgetary flexibility is one of the things that's a strength of, of our town. So, um, but exec, Bob, I think I agree. We can't necessarily tell the region what to do, but um, I know they have the tools to do it. Um, they just need to update them and, and plug them away, plug the information to them. So um, that might be something BCG wants to look at um, again, when that group comes together with representatives from the different parties. Dorothy? And that's a that's a good clarification of my point. Well, from the pre the viewpoint of precinct ten, what this is is a juggernaut of obligations and pressures that are going to be financed by increasing the density in housing in the downtown residential neighborhoods. And you saw in the last election what the will of the people is on that. Um, and I, I just see saying, well, we have to have the money. We have to do this. We have to do that. We have to allow this backing, forcing us to make decisions we might not want to make 
but being under financial duress, saying we've got to have revenue growth and this seems to be the way to get it. So um, I, I, I see this from the point of view of the people in my part of the town, this is threatening. This is, this is it's tight and we have promises that somehow will become more efficient, but yet we're increasing our services in order to reach goals that we've agreed on. But um, it's like part of the discussion last night about the solar moratorium. It part for a while there, it was just on, can we afford to do anything that might engender a lawsuit? And I mean, that's not the way to make a decision, you know? Um, but when you get worried about money, when budgets get tight, sometimes that's how you do make a decision. Um, so we didn't last night. Um, so, I mean, is, is the savior gonna be marijuana um, receipts? Um, I mean, somehow I just see a position that's very, very tight, very, very tight, and I'm not sure how it's going to be accomplished. So I'm concerned. Just to quickly round that out, um, cannabis revenues are already, the tax revenues are already budgeted for um, in the budget. So we don't expect a huge increase in that revenue area. Thank you. Good. That's something that I've not, it's not really on our agenda at the moment, but you know, that's clearly an expectation that has been thrown out there by the uh, African Heritage Group. Lynn? I'm kind of not sure exactly which section we're on but I'm still on page five yep. and the paragraph that before I started editing starts on page four. And I'm not sure this is the place to bring it in, but at no time during the process of the schools talking about how they were being unfairly treated because they were only being given the 2.5% have we brought up the fact that in the town's ARPA money, unless we're changing this, we're planning to subsidize capital improvements to the middle school and operating to the middle school. And I think it, it, this should be brought out here. And I think it should be calculated X amount of money over how many years, which results in a percent, what percentage of increase to their budget. And just adding to what Lynn said real quick, Andy, you might also want to note in this section, the schools also get money from UMass now, um, elementary schools in particular, they get $160,000 or $170,000 each year from UMass as part of an agreement. Um, the town no longer gets money directly. Uh, that's something that's a goal, obviously, for us moving forward. But um, the money used, this money used to go to the town and support the overall budget. Now it goes directly to the schools and the town doesn't um, benefit from the town operating budget doesn't benefit from that. Um, and that's a recurring annual source of revenue that is relatively new for them. Thank you, that's a good point. Yeah. Kathy? Um, I like Lynn's suggestion a lot. And, and you know, the, I mean, she's probably gonna send you an edit to do that, but it's, it's to say over how many years, um, and I know we're not supposed to bring in CPA funds. This is the town's uh, manager's piece, but there's a big ask on the table for the playing fields for the regional school. Um, and, and I mean big, $800,000. Uh, so it's, so, you know, just somehow bringing in, this isn't the only budget and it, it doesn't address three years from now, right? So it's that multi-year thing, but it does address, what is the appearance of the FY23? There, that there's more money in there. Um, the fact, and I guess the regional, the uh, getting ready for the sixth grade to go up to the regional, that's a savings for the elementary school. Is that correct, Sean? Because that would have otherwise have have to be billed to their their budget in some way. Um, I mean, it's a weird thing because it's no. So it, it'll be an increased cost to the elementary school. Um, yeah. 
at while both while Fort River and Wildwood are both in operation because I, I think there's, I won't have this exactly right, but there may be some additional staffing um, and there may be a rent payment of some sort that has to go to the region for using space. So it'll be more expensive, which is part of that ARPA request. That's what that ARPA request is for outside of capital is to cover the additional costs. But hopefully long-term, once um, the building project is done, there'll be some savings there. But Lynn's point was is that it's town ARPA funds, not school ARPA funds, and but we should just point that out. So okay, now that's all helpful. And uh, what I was gonna what I'm gonna do is and may call on other people to help me with paragraphs that they were talking about if I feel I need to in the end. Um, but uh, try as quickly as I can while this is fresh on my mind and before I get to the turkey and whatnot in my brain and slow my brain down. Um, I uh, try and see if I can do this and uh, then get it around uh, in the next part of our process. So I will, um, I wrote Lynn's name down, for example, next to this paragraph to somebody who I can, might call on. Uh, any, anything else then under the, uh, this section that we're on currently, which is expenses for operations. Kathy? Yeah. Um, I just, as you're, as Lynn is sending you some texts for here on this, we still seem to be on page five, but the second to last paragraph is we urge you to include ARPA funds in the projections. We've, we've called that out. So it will be a nice, if Lynn, you give Andy words that goes with the schools, it will be a nice um, go with piece that, um, you know, and I'm not even sure, Sean, in the FY23, the way you've talked about revenues, there's not a line called ARPA. <laughs> so the ARPA funds are coming in in various ways to help us out, um, whether it's in the capital budget and expenses we would have otherwise had. So um, if, if there is a table or something you can give Andy, it could be the appendix to this rather than beefing this up a lot, just to say, you know, this much is going over to schools, this much is going to fire EMS, this much, because it's not showing up in the budget we're looking at. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I think you know, I mean, you've hit on a problem that I had in writing it and um, because a lot of the discussion that we've been having around budget issues is interweaving grants, ARPA funds, and other funds with operational funds, because the goal was, how can the town pay for this, whether it be Crest or whatever? And uh, I think that, you know, this is ultimately a document about one thing, which is the FY23 budget, but um, you know, it's sort of like we put these pieces together because it made sense and it was really creative. I think we really are appreciative of having it happen. But when Paul um, proposes to the council on uh, the beginning of May, is May 2nd, by the way, because it's the first Monday, uh, that uh, this is what the budget that I would like to see, he has to have gone through the steps of pulling back out the pieces that are in the budget that he's presenting. And that's the budget he, that he's presenting to us is the uh, FY23 budget itself. Um, all these other things supplement it, but they're not part of it. So I think we're struggling with something that he's going to be struggling with, I would guess. Yeah, I think, you know, Andy, I think that's true, but the police had 
a long-term multi-year grant that supported that extra person that was dealing with uh, community and violence. And it always came up in the budget that we had a person, and as long as they got that money, they would continue to have this. So I do think we're asking that in the budget discussions, yes, we would like this. This is going to be, you know, maybe an unusual year in our lifetime that from the federal government comes this gift. <laughs> but but it's real money and it's not just another $25,000 grant. So I just think trying to weave it in both here, but then, as you said, when Paul brings the budget back to us um, in, as part of the budget story. Uh, so, so people get this larger picture um, and also that, okay, that gets us through 23, 24, whatever the year is, then, you know, it, then we're back to uh, the normal sources of revenues. Um, yeah, that's actually a good point. And the reason, because I've been struggling with that and how to get it in there. Really, ARPA and these grants and all of the, and the special chunk that we got from the legislature to assist us, uh, I think it was labeled as public health, but it was really around CRESS. Uh, it's real money and it's helping us do something. Um, and we want to make sure that we show how it came in. But the other thing that we're, I, I think, ought to be concerned about is what happens when it ends and what's the path forward beyond that and i think that's where we probably have the greatest degree of concern and feeling that um, there hasn't been a projection when we talk about multi-year it's sort of this um, way of putting it but that's what it's really about So how to, you know, have we expressed that strongly? Have I expressed in the draft strongly enough or do I need to beef that up somehow? I think I have to reread it to see after today's meeting. Matt? Well, I, I was, um, it's funny because I, I was asking for the, um, the, the management policies and objectives document that you know we started off talking about, and you know that does call explicitly for a five-year, you know, working budget annually. And and you know, I mean, you might even just lift that section directly out of that draft, Andy, and 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 put it in here. You know, with with all, of, I it's really an excellent point. I mean, both on the expenditure side in terms of of this ambitious agenda. And on the revenue side, in terms of all these sort of uncertainties with with um, state and federal support, so I I do think calling for that. I've I've certainly heard Sean. I've probably heard your presentation four or five times now, and, and I you know I know Sean's thinking five to ten years out on every on every presentation, and I I, I feel like that would be something that they uh, Sean and Paul and the team would would jump at. I think is to provide that kind of projection because I know they're worried about that when they're thinking about hiring people. As you know, as we are, I mean, as as every everybody who's using state and federal money is, you know, constantly worried about, well, I can't hire somebody on a grant unless I have a, a plan to keep them, you know, or or I'm very upfront with them on day one and say, look, this is a grant funded position, I I can't make a guarantee. So, uh, I think I think the five year language out of the um, management policies document would be very useful here. Andy, can I just follow up on that yeah. real quick? So, um, so again, we do. We do put a five-year budget projection in the budget document. What we don't do, I think, is the level of detail um, that some people are asking for, which is like the five-year projection for fire salaries or something. You know, we project out the operating budgets at two and a half percent, our revenues, our pensions, our OPEB obligations, our capital, and we look to see if we're um, in balance, and then and then department heads have to make those decisions within their operating budgets each year. Um, I don't think we're going to be changing the budget presentation to be that much different than where we are now. But I think one thing that would be reasonable this year in particular um, would be, and I, I assume we'll get this to you sooner than the budget document, but to um, include a, a detailed section on ARPA, 
um, and the transition planning related to ARPA, either in the budget document or prior to the budget document. Um, we're planning to do, do that anyway. So I think that would be totally reasonable. Yeah, I was uh, circling back and then I see Matt Kathy's hands are up. Uh, you know, way back at the beginning, we talked about the fact that uh, the council wants us to talk about the creation of two new departments and what the financial uh, implications are and get that to TSO before the public forum on the subject of the creation of the departments. And I'm not sure that we aren't really in some way hitting on the theme that we might come up with at that point, because is that what we ought we are going to want to say at the uh, have said at the public forum that uh, we're concerned about not the first year but the years out. So we'll all this is going to come back to circle on us at some point. Kathy, I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. And I, you know, I this is one when I spoke earlier about the structure, I would make this a bullet about the multi-year budget, um, you know, that, you know, it's ambitious. And when I said a budget, Sean, um, it's a question I asked the library director too. She said, yeah, we have a budget. It goes up by this much. I said, no, that I want you to tell me your staff and then show me with step increases, with health insurance and whatever, how much it will cost to maintain that staff if we don't, you know, we don't cut hours. So, you know, starting from a base and going up and then saying, and if we only have a two and a half percent increase in each of these, um, you know, trying to give that sense of, of the um, box we're in or the limits we're in. Um, so I'm not asking you to change your whole budgeting process. M numbers work miracles. If I plug in two and a half percent and I've got revenues coming in at two and a half percent, it all works. Um, but it's like, what's underneath that? Um, so I'm not asking you to do every department, but um, so sometimes it's called zero-based budgeting where you're, you're budgeting up from what you want to, what you want to provide. But I think we, it, at least need to give everyone, not just the council, but residents in the town, a sense of all of this. Um, not to say that there's a smart way out of this, it's, it's the theme of tough choices. Um, so I would just put that up as a highlight and not to back away from this, because it's much nicer to bring good news. Um, it is. Uh... Well, it's not always our job to just do good news, as you know. Um, yeah, two things that I thought about as you were speaking, I thought that, again, we're circling back to prior conversations because there was also some mention earlier in our discussion today about inflation. And there was a discussion that Lynn brought up about employees um, being drawn away for higher, higher compensation at other employers, whether they be public or private. And um, what are the financial consequences of that, but also what are we doing in future year budgeting to um, recognize that? And uh, you know, is, that a, uh, is that a problem? And then there's a, uh, last piece that I have on it, which is, uh, and this goes back to my having been director of a nonprofit organization. If you go out too far in this direction and discussions with my board of directors so that I was uh, feeding the employees with all sorts of arguments that they could make about why they should get higher salaries. So it, uh, you know, where, where it fits into collective bargaining for that matter. Uh, but uh, Kathy, it would be helpful if you started collecting the bullets that you had wanted at the beginning, and then uh, that would be a really good way to go. Dorothy, your hand is up. Um, okay, since we're in this mood, um, I'm hoping that there is some shadow planning going on. Um, 
my mind just went back to New York City. And I remembered um, what building projects got wrapped. I ended up teaching at a school after it had been wrapped for three or four years. They actually wrapped it up, stopped, had to stop all work on it. They didn't let it de decay like on Spring Street. And it, so it became a fabulous school, which is really great now. Um, all contracts were renegotiated. All salary increases were frozen. Um, we did get them back later if you were a teacher and you could hang in there for you know 10 years, you did get the money back at some point. Um, and the schools cut down all electives. Um, and that included science, gym, music, art. Okay. Um, we did survive, the city did survive, but that's because they had, you know, a huge staff and they had a wonderful dedicated public servants. We have great public servants, but there were some little people in some corner somewhere that said, if this happens, okay, what do we do in terms of our four capital projects? Which one, I mean, we think the school is going forward now, which is what I really hope, okay? How do we do it? What can we hold? What can we negotiate? How can we, how can we handle it? And so we won't be thinking about raising salaries to lure people or keep people. We'll be talking about cutting, okay? I just have that feeling, I don't know. I just have that feeling that we're coming for another moment, another part of the cycle. And I hope that there's some deep thinking going on in the processes of town hall that is playing with scenarios, that's all. This is again, part of our multi-year planning thing, uh, Sean. So some of this may fall on Paul, or probably a lot of this falls on Paul, but I, but I know one thing that would be helpful, we sort of laid out all the wants. We, we do a good job of identifying all the wants, higher salaries, more firefighters, sustainability, um, reparation funding. I mean, we do a really good job of, of laying out the wants. Um, I feel like it would be helpful for a priority discussion um, about what are the highest priorities. I think we, and, and that would include existing programs. I mean, we talk, these are all new things, but we never talk about, well, if you want to do that, we, you know, this program, we, we don't care that much about. I know those are the hard conversations, um, but, you know, hearing what everybody's talking about and this concern about going forward, I mean, that's really the step we need to get to as a more public dialogue about what are the highest priorities um, for the council that, that can inform Paul and my uh, planning around the budget. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of that. Again, I think we do a good job of identifying the needs and, and the issues, but um, at some point we've got to really say, all right, well, this is the most important and this is the least important. So we, we know how to allocate funds. Um, and again, I think we need to take into account existing programs that are already here because some, they all increase in cost. Personnel are, is our biggest cost that goes up every year. Um, and so sometimes the decisions between existing program and a new program. Um, so that would be my advice hearing people's concerns about the future. I think it's, you know, we are talking about a lot of new initiatives and that can be overwhelming. And so having this, a better sense of our priorities would be helpful. Yeah, and I actually, um, I think that's why I was having so much trouble drafting this document is that I was trying to kind of get that across with facts to this council and the next council. And I may not have done a very good job of it, but that's what I was trying to do. Um, Lynn? So I've built up a couple of comments. First of all, I think you are doing that in this document and um, please take our comments as, um, you know, things we'd like to see, but it's you can't do that unless you have a good document to start with. So we're doing that because we have a good document to start with. Um, I wanna go back to this issue of the multi-year projections and add to it that for the last, um, couple of years, I believe that the council has been pretty um, discouraged by the fact that we don't get a little more detail in the school and Jones library budgets. And uh, we would like to see more detail. Um, so multi-year end detail uh, would be useful. Now that, that's a double-edged sword because then you're gonna have counselors, um, my colleagues, our colleagues, 
who are going to say, well, then I think you should cut this line item. And that's not our job. Um, but um, the fact that we are asked to approve a school budget on the basis of, you know, maybe two or three sheets of paper is pretty astounding uh, to me. Um, are the, we're, we're, back, we're going to approve a municipal budget for which we get about two or three sheets of paper for a very large portion of that municipal budget. And that, so I think we need a little more detail. Um, I wanna go on to my next point. Uh, and that is somewhere in here, um, I started weaving it into the end of that same paragraph that I wanted to bring in the ARPA funds. Uh, I think we need to reinforce our position that we did on uh, Saturday at the Four Towns meeting that uh, we're willing to pay our share, but why should our share in, in essence not lead to good solid ongoing programming? Instead, it leads to us subsidizing the fact that the other towns don't pay their share. And I understand that the state formula has this sense of, you know, the the richer towns should pay for the poorer towns, but it's hard for me to tell you um, which towns are richer when you look at housing in Shutesbury, Leverett, and Pelham. Um, Dorothy? When the discussion of more discussion on priorities. I remember hearing from a lot of people that at some goal setting back in the day when we met with the public and were on little tables and had discussions and wrote on boards and pads, that there were goal setting meetings and that the number one priority was the fire department. And does anyone remember that? And yet so our plans are not being based on that. They're being based on our difficulty in finding a site. So I, I, I think that's, that's not good. That's not good. So I know, Lynn, I, I know that you probably know the answer to this, so I'm asking. If I knew the answer to this, <laughs> I, would, it, I think we're trying to do both, three things. I think we're trying to look at fire at EMS capacity. We're looking at their new building and we're looking at their equipment. And all three of them in my mind are on the plate. Okay, um, I we should go on, but uh, you just brought up a point about uh, what the expectations are of what we'd like to see from the library and the schools in their budgets. And when we get on to page seven at the top and budget process, that's really where it probably needs to go. And uh, so we should make sure we get back to that when we get to seven. But if there's no objection, I would say let's go on to expenses for capital. And uh, we have our expert here too, as is Kathy, who's both chair of the school building committee and chair of uh, JCPC. So, uh, but Lynn, you have your hand up. Yeah, you know, I I think you're trying to say this in the first paragraph, but it doesn't come out as clear. And that is that our present debt is extremely low. And that's what, that is part of what is that end, the bond rating and the strength of our reserves is what is, is allowing us to even think about these projects. Yeah. Dorothy? Yeah, that is the big difference between this, the dire scenarios I was repeating from New York City. With that was all that happened at a high interest time. And that's one of the reasons that we are pushing forward. We are in a low, unusually, really incredible low interest time. So it really, you know, makes you want to push forward as, as, as hard as you can go, because I just can't see how this is going to stay, you know, this, it's unusual, at least in my lifetime, it's very unusual to have this 
low interest for this long. Yeah, again, I get back to, uh, and Sonia can uh, speak to this too, and that is that uh, what Lynn spoke about, about our debt load being low, our S, you know, trying to get our standard and course rating as high as we possibly can and building reserves has been a long part of a three part strategy to get us where we are to be able to build the buildings. Because I think Sonia is lift with trying to make it happen. I think we've been successful at making that happen over the years. But it's take it, it required discipline. It did. That's why I get frustrated when we want to spend our reserves. Sorry, Sean. Or other things. I just it's been a long time and it's difficult choices through the years, but it's good that we had that through the COVID pandemic. Sonia's not happy with the 25% reserve level. She, she wants to push for the for the 27. I get it. I'm we with her. I no, it. I want to we push got... for the 25 as the norm. Uh, yeah. Well, we, we got that. Kathy, you have your hand up. You know, Andy, the, the beginning paragraph under capital, I think you just gave wording that would strengthen that if we added um, that words um, at the beginning that we've had a very successful three-part strategy um, to build up our ability to address capital needs. We've drawn down debt. Um, uh, we've built up reserves and we've been moving toward a target rate of 10% a year allocated to capital, just clearly stating that sets you up for the other paragraphs then. You know, and the drawn down debt, you can do one more sentence that we are, um, we've been paying off previous debt and we've been avoiding incurring large increasing debt. So our debt service is going to be, you know, over the coming years for existing debt. So I think you can just add that paragraph and then um, then it can go on to the four major capital projects and the building up to 10%. Um, and it will make that segue of this, this is indeed financial planning around capital. Um, and, and if you need to put, what I was saying at the very beginning, you have the bond rating and some other that up at the beginning. It's not here, but it, you know the bond rating helps us get uh, debt at lower interest rates as well as other things, but it's here. Um, and I just, you think you could strengthen that three-part strategy to make it clear that there's been a very deliberate, careful um, set of long-term plans, long-range planning around this. It's impressive. So it's, it's worth stating. Bernie? You want to uh, include OPEB set asides in that strategy. I mean, it sends a very strong message to Mr. Market that we're planning, and uh, it's important. I think that's in the um, the next section at the top. There's um, we'd want it because I were talking about Bernie. I think add in a section on OPEB. It's a question yeah. of time. Other, and other other budget needs, but yeah. Um, the uh, where it ties together is, is that I think that uh, Sean, you've been at S and P rep, uh, meetings. Um, the S and P likes the fact that we are that we've created and continually, to the best of our ability, funded up of trust, and that helps protect our rating. Yeah, I mean, honestly, there's two areas. There's two areas of our um, our rating that are that could improve um opeb is actually one area where we could improve they like that we have a consistent contribution um but it's not as much as it would be to or should be if we wanted to fund it within 20 to 30 years um what we've told them is you know our plan and this is something we'll bring back to finance committee is when the hampshire county pension system is fully funded that's when we will beef up our opeb contribution to get that funded at a faster rate um but so OPEB is actually an area where I don't think we got a bad score, but we also did get a, a bonus or any extra points for um, 
having a fully funded uh, program. Um, and then the other area that we don't just don't have a lot of control over is the um, the income levels in town because of the students and how that impacts um, sort of our average income and buying power in town. Um, it kind of skews it a little bit. So, uh, but OPEB is one area where we could we could still grow and and contribute more and get uh, a better score. Um. So anything else under the uh, capital section? Lynn, if, are you, you're muted though. I just wanna correct one misimpression that people have. And that is that a ladder truck, it's maybe good for maybe a three or four story building it's not good for anything much beyond that. Why they really want one is so that they can get over top of fire and spray down on it. And we saw them do that in the South Amherst fire just about two years ago. So, so Andy, my comment or question is also about the ladder truck section, not, I don't really know anything about ladder trucks, to be honest, but I, it did sort of jump out at me as maybe, I think, um, should, could this be folded into a more general set of operating? In other words, is this the document where we make these statements about ladder truck or is that, I, I mean, it's, I guess it's kind of an open question because it, it came up in our last meeting and I don't know, is, is, that a, is that a typical way to treat a question like that or? Is there more information we're still waiting to hear from from Sean before we have you know sufficient information to make to even give guidance? I guess my question. So I think I asked for the ladder truck to be explicitly sort of put in here because the ladder truck it's a very large expenditure. Um, it's one of those things that we feel like should be a shared expense among the town, but also some of the key partners in town and maybe surrounding towns. And that we're sort of constantly pursuing that additional funding, but um, at some point we just need to make the decision whether we're going to go forward and buy it. So I think I asked for it to be included this year to be um, to to raise its importance um, and send that message during the budget process. Okay. Um, just on, well, I guess still on ladder truck. Yeah, you know, I agree, Lynn, what you said about tall built, tall and taller buildings, but. Uh, Fire chief, when he was with us at the budget, said, "If we want to build four and five story buildings, we need a lot ladder truck." He said that he said they aren't any good for UMass for the big UMass buildings. And then he made your other point. So I would just add a sentence. And the notion of linkage fees uh, that was inserted here, I found at least one town in Massachusetts that to address these kinds of things, big new developments we're paying into a fire EMS fund um, because as density increased, um, particularly as, or as height, uh, so it was pre-funding, it was for capital. It wasn't for operations, it was pre-funding that. So we don't have that kind of fee, but Burlington, Vermont does. And I think it's Medford. I sent it to Sean on a one town had a whole long list of, uh, of, of linkage fees. But what they were looking to do is build up their ability off of new developments. Whether we want to do that or not is a question, but it was for these kinds of expenditures, which are particularly needed. So um, and and the, the notion of regional, I know. Uh, Sean, we've been going down this route, but when I was Googling ladder trucks, this is a constant issue for smaller towns. I mean, smaller meaning population and uh, a number of buildings because each ladder truck is really expensive. Um, so uh, ours, ours gets borrowed, but it gets borrowed less because it's not functional. So people can't can't borrow it right now, or it's you know offline. Um, but but you you see other towns seeking to do this. And then my last question, and this is purely a tech question. Um, 
Europe has a different kind of ladder truck. It's not a full service everything truck. One has the ladder and one has the pumper wagon, Lynn. And the actual truck with the ladder is not as expensive. So I do not know whether there are things on the market in the United States. Um, Steve Schreiber made this comment about thinner and shorter fire engines, you know, in terms of fitting in our buildings. Um, I have no idea. Um, but it was, is there an alternative that gives us what we need out of a ladder truck that do, isn't the full blown ladder truck? So, and that, it's, it's a question. So I am ju just doing it because I think when I see in Europe, part of it is their streets aren't as big as ours. The kind of things we have won't fit down an Italian and a Swiss street, but they do have ladder trucks, you know, so they developed a way of getting up and spraying down, um, not not on high rises. So, so it, it's it's a question on what's out there that might not be traditional and might be somewhat less expensive. So I don't want to put that in this document, but I think it is goes in this bundle of something that's in a million and a half plus expense expense item. We should be super careful um, to do it in the best way we can. So. Um, I actually support keeping this in here, even though it's a little strange. I'm the one that asked recently if we had the, could we order the truck without having appropriated the money? And the answer is no. So we have to appropriate the money to, in order to order the truck. And then once we order the truck, it'll probably be close to two years before we get it. So I think we need to go ahead and buy the damn truck. <laughs> Uh -huh. You could you could write that in the guidelines. That would be very direct if you wanted to put that in there. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate a point that I made last time and that the fire chief made to us some, some time ago, which is the ladder truck is also important to get above a house that's set back from the street. It's a, it's a lateral thing, not just a vertical thing. So my house sits probably 40 feet from the street. I sure as heck would like a ladder truck to be able to get in there and put water on top of my house if I needed it. Um, so it's it's safety for everybody. It's not just for the downtown area with the higher, you know, the, the taller buildings. So we should add sentences, Bob and Lynn, to this to, to make that point. Yep. Sure. Takes a little bit away from the linkage argument, I suppose. Uh, Dorothy? Uh, the linkage argument reminds me of something that I'm hearing from a lot of people, which is, and, and we've mentioned it, we have to uh, increase fees to cover the cost of the service. So that, uh, for example, inspection fees, um, there's a lot of movement. People are saying they want to have how buildings, in the rental buildings inspected upon registration, not waiting for that first complaint as because many towns do that. But of course, that would mean hiring more inspectors. And that would mean the fees need to be commensurate to being able to hire that so that services pay for themselves. And I know we've kind of talked about this, but I don't think that's happened. So I, I think that's a very important concept that in order to provide some services, we can, um, try to get them on a self-supporting paying as, as wherever possible. And that would be one. And one way to do it instead of the inspection fee being for the whole property, but it would be per unit, the fee. So if somebody with you know 40 units would pay the same one the same fee as somebody with two units, which is where, how it is at present. It's, people were just talking about this to me with me on Sunday. So um, I don't know where that would go, but I know, in fact, I think, Sean, aren't you the one who's supposed to be in charge of Looking so, at all those fees and doing that. Yeah. So we um we did a fee comparison not long ago, and part of our budget process um is to send fees out to all the departments and they review them, um, and so we've done that the last few years, and um, so it is something we look at every single year. So if there's ever a specific area you want us to highlight for departments to take a closer look at, we can certainly do that. But we do send it out to departments every year and ask them to review their fees to see if they are still keeping up with their costs. Because the parking permits was one thing that has been brought up many, many times. The twenty-five. Yeah, that's, that's, that's coming up. You you wait a couple meetings. Okay. You'll be seeing that. 
Okay, and the other one is the inspection fee for rental properties. People yep. want more, and that would mean hiring more staff, but the staff should be paid for out of the fees. I'll mention that one to um, the inspection department to take a closer look at. Okay, seeing nothing, somebody else is asking, I think, can I assume that we got where we want to go with the uh, capital and that other budget needs is really just a couple sentences because it's really addressed recognizing Hampshire County retirement, no pep. Uh, there's one that disappeared, but I didn't bother to put it out. And I just, we don't have to pay for regional lockup anymore. For those who remember town meeting every year, having to appropriate money for regional lockup, all of a sudden they found other money to pay for it. So they don't have to build towns, which then gets us into the budget process, Lynn. This is just a pause here because I put a note. We had this whole thing when Hampshire County was finally dissolved and Sean or uh, Sonia or Andy, didn't the state take off some money we owed and we no longer owe it? What was that? Yeah, so the, um, the pension obligation for Hampshire County used to be folded into our assessment. Yeah. All the member towns would help contribute to pay for that obligation. Um, and that portion, I believe, has now gone away. It's a small enough portion that it didn't it didn't make a noticeable impact in how much our costs went up. But it's the it is the retirement portion for the old cog um, is now funded by the state, I believe. So we still have obligation though. For the for we the belong cog. for our own employees to the for our own employees. Got yeah. it. But okay, the, thank the you. council government employees are now out off of that system. Got it. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Um, so there, since there isn't much to say here, in the next section to budget process, the one thing that I had noted earlier was that there was a suggestion that we say a little bit more about what we expect in the library and school budgets than is currently here. Uh, otherwise, I don't know, if, uh, Bob. I just wanted to throw this out. Um, we talk about in the second paragraph, you know, we're the, the the new finance committee or the new the the new council. Um, maybe it would be helpful to the new members of the council, and I don't know how it's going to go with the, how the finance committee is going to be. Um, rejiggered at all, if, if at all, but it might be helpful for us to meet um, more frequently in January and February with the council or with members of the council that uh, just to kind of talk about the budget, the issues, things like that, just as an educational process. Um, I actually have to turn to uh, Sean, Sonia, and uh, Lynn, because I think that there has been discussion about uh, orientation of new counselors. Yeah, I think um, I think the plan is to do an orientation. I think it would make sense for finance committee to be there um, if we wanted to make it a, I'm not sure if it was intended to be a public meeting or a uh, private meeting. I assume it'll be public because there'll be counselors at that point. Um, but I, I don't see why finance committee members couldn't join if they want to participate and give their, their insights on the process. Okay, thanks. Um, the, the one orientation that presently is scheduled is before the new council is seated and sworn in. That's on, a, that's on um, December 13th. However, it will be a public meeting. It starts at 5.30. Um, we're trying to actually not, it, that meeting is so loaded that if anybody comes out of that with any sense of the budget, I'll be astounded. Um, so, I actually think that your suggestion is an excellent one. Uh, and that, because when we first started with the council, we had actually had a full council orientation to every department at some level. So then the next time, so when the budget actually came up, 
um, we weren't flying blind in terms of each of the departments. And if we wanted to, the finance committee could host those discussions and make them available to all counselors, but it could be done with the idea that if the finance committee gets a little more um, of an orientation to what constitutes town government, and I don't just mean an organization chart, which is basically what they've seen. Um, I think it would be useful to do that in February, uh, probably February. I'm not, I don't think it's going to happen in January. <clears throat> and it, I don't think it would be a ter terrible waste of time either. The other, only other thing, Andy, I actually don't remember, but I think by the time we were seated on December 3rd, the financial guidelines had already been developed. They were. So your first statement is not correct. You had already started the budget process as a select board um, when we were sworn in. And then we did. So the, the old finance committee developed the guidelines. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were truncated from what the old guidelines used to be like. But they did guidelines to start out the first process. That's my recollection. So. Yeah, I guess the, uh, the other thing I just threw for everybody present, uh, but mostly for uh, our resident members is that uh, actually we're kind of in a uh, strange position at the end of, uh, at the beginning of January, because the three of you have continuing terms on the committee. The rest of us do not have continuing terms on the committee. And so our terms expire uh, on January 2nd, and uh, we're not members of the finance committee then, unless we are reappointed um, after the new council forms. Um, so uh, one of the three of you might end up being temporary chairman, who knows? Uh, in any event, uh, it is one of the crazy things. And, uh, you know, the other thing to note is, is that everybody here from the council, all, all five of us, um, ran for and were reelected so that uh, none of us are, are disappearing from the council, but we don't have an appointment to the committee that extends until uh, beyond January 2nd. There is a strong yeah. push, however, to have committee appointments to the four committees made within that first week because CRC has now scheduled a hearing on uh, January 10th. Kathy? Um, I just want to completely endorse the scheduling, and, and I would put it as a sentence here on process that we're recommending a meeting in February with the new council. And I found it on um, the, the inherited guidelines that we got that first year was a document that I had all sorts of yellow highlights on because there was the clearest explanation of what two and a half is. <laughs> and what we can do with it. And I sat at a finance committee meeting that was pre-council election where they deliberately wrote more than they would have because they were giving it as a gift to us coming in. So I think this could be part of February that at this point, hopefully we know how that works, but, but that's not, um, it, it, it's, it's buried documents if you try to find exactly how it works in the budget. So it was just a very useful thing that they gave us aside from guidelines. They gave us some uh, basic, some budget basics in, in that last guideline that they handed over. Um, so I think asking for a February meeting for this would be really good. Um, in terms of a, it's it's more than a primer. It's trying to give people the same sense of this is where the where we're getting money, where it's going, et cetera. Um, yeah, great, I, uh, great, idea, great idea. <laughs> I did include, as you noted, a, a, a link to the uh, Department of Revenue uh, Division of Local Services uh, primer on 
two and a half. I'll be shocked if anybody actually uses the link to read the damn thing, but it was a valiant attempt. Yeah. Lynn? Yeah, two things. Um, I think we also need to uh, recognize that Andy, you may be the only person on the finance committee now and on the council that has ever gone through a two and a half override and how you do one. Maybe uh, Bernie, you probably have done it in another location, but um, it, the whole issue of how you do two and a half overrides and so forth will fall to some extent on the finance committee because we the finance committee deals with the large capital projects. And when we get to the school, um, there is just about no way we can do it without a two and a half override. So um, we, we have a steep learning curve on, for this council on that issue. I think Sonia, Sonia was here in 2016 oh. too, right? So her and Andy, yeah. Thanks. Sonia, I'm not going to use this as an opportunity to say, don't leave us too soon. Sonia had a run, but she wishes everybody a thanks happy Thanksgiving. So. <laughs> um, she, she's on vacation today, so she's, uh, she's volunteering. Uh, this, she's cool. a, a, a symbol of what you were all talking about at the beginning of the, of the meeting. So. Well, she's, and she has been for a long time. Um, so... Uh, Planning for future years was our last section, uh, pretty much. And uh, I think to some extent, we've been in that a little bit. Bob? Yeah, um, I, I, I think the... Um... The discussion of the pilot is very good. I think I think we really need to focus on it. You know, I think we need to focus um, the, the 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 manager and the council's um, uh, attention on that issue. Um, the only thing I I saw there here that I I have an issue with is is in the last paragraph where we talk about advocating for increases in state income tax. I don't know that it's appropriate for us to recommend or advocate for a particular type of taxation or whatever. I mean, I think we can we can advocate for greater state aid to Amherst, but I think it's up to the state, you know, the legislature and the governor to figure out how they would do that. And I, I don't I don't think it's appropriate for this organization or even the council to do that. That's just my my opinion. Kathy? Um, I, I agree with Bob, although I probably wrote that sentence a year ago, Bob, <laughs> because I was looking at how much the state's income tax had gone down on capital um, and what, a, what that would have bought us in roads and schools. But um, yep. the only comment I had and he comes off of last night's discussion when, let me find, um, when, when we're talking about the UMass strategic partnership um, and we say it's a model, last night, I think we said we want the, the town manager to execute a strategic management agreement with the colleges, not just with UMass. You know, so um, I would write this a little bit stronger. Um, you know, we're saying it's great that we have one, but we really need to ex execute it with UMass as well as the coll other colleges. So it, here it says it serves as a model with working with the other two institutions. I would just do it. Um, and we thank UMass for giving us some gifts. So it's always nice that they do give us some money. Um, so I, I'm just at changing the words to a stronger word. Um, that's it. And I agree with Bob saying, you know, should advocate for more money, uh, more money from the state. You know, they're, they're getting a big chunk of ARPA money that they still have to distribute. And they were talking about a big, a huge piece being housing money. 
um, affordable housing money and home ownership money. And it would be great if the, it would help us a lot if that came or if we got some roads and bridges out of them. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, Lou. Oh, um, actually, I just, if, while you're mentioning uh, UMass up at the uh, top of eight, I think that might be where it is. Maybe it's at the bottom of another page. Um, I also think it would be useful um, to recognize the chamber and the bid because of the integral nature that they have become to our economic development. And some of that has been financial in relationship, you know, grants to do small business work, et cetera. That's one thing. The other thing that going back to that last paragraph, I probably wouldn't be as specific but the schools have a list of certain things that they would like to see changed in the school formula, um, mostly around charter schools. And the other issue is, I'm, I'm not gonna get the right name, but it's something that holds us harmless um, for some kind of increase. Sean, you probably have the name for that. Yeah, but no, it's it, chapter 70, hold harmless aid, yeah. Thank you. Charter school formula is actually mentioned in the second to last paragraph in that section. Would you put um, bid and chamber into the conclusion section with thank yous, appreciation, or would you? I, you know, it's interesting. I maybe I, I just want to bring them in. I mean, there's been other nonprofit partners um, that have been critical to the survival through this time. And two of them are the Survival Center and um, Amherst Family Outreach uh, that we've given money to, that they in turn could help buy meals for families um, from restaurants. And so there's been a, a real group effort around economic vitality issues uh, in relationship to those two groups of uh, nonprofits. Survival Center and Family Outreach. Family Outreach, yeah. They're the ones that manage the meal program. As I go through it, I'll see where I can fit it in, Bernie. Uh, just a quick note that pilot programs are voluntary. So, um, um, you know, and, and um, you don't want to give people the impression, that you, you know, we don't have them because we're not, we don't have the right legislation. But even Boston is, uh, even Boston, which is the exception, almost everything in the Commonwealth has a voluntary program. Um, and they... Um, they all these pilot, the pilot programs all seem to have a community benefit offset, so that uh, you're you're it recognizes some of the contributions that uh, not not for profit tax exempts make. And in Amherst College's case, it would be all the property they leave on the tax rolls uh, would come off of any pilot agreement as a, a community uh, community benefit payment. Um. Yeah, the one thing I didn't really touch on too much is that uh, we were approached as a council probably about a year ago uh, by a group of uh, cities and towns that have been pressing the legislature to create a um, statutory uh, right of cities and towns to impose require uh, pilot payments. And, uh, you know, we did talk about it a little bit at the time, but it sort of died away there after a point and it was being pressed by uh, a legislator who had, uh, how shall I say, it didn't have uh, a lot of friends across the board and uh, so those we were sort of cautioned about uh, not getting too close um, but 
there is that legislation out there. And I know that uh, uh, Dave Narkowitz in Northampton was pressing really hard on that issue at one point. They, they, they keep trying. I mean, when I was managing Deerfield, that was part of an effort along with Northampton and a couple of other towns to well, any Steve town. Steve Kulik was the one who was sponsored for a while. Yeah, uh, we, we had been working on it and, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the tax exempt uh, organizations, these little places like Harvard and MIT and the like, um, we're not very happy. <laughs> so I think New Hampshire, I'm uh, not to beat this into the ground, but I think New Hampshire has a, a system whereby um, certain portions of um, private university properties can be taxed. Um, but it's been a while since I've looked at it. So if the council is willing to have that in our section on uh, where we mentioned legislative pushes. Well, you, you do mention um, on page eight, you do mention uh, oh, legislation think. permitting assessment of pilot fees, which right now, the only pilot fees we're allowed to negotiate or assess are for solar projects. Uh, Matt? So this is totally uh, stepping away from, from that. That's a super fascinating conversation though. So it's hard to step out of it, but I, I did want to just sort of um, indicate a, a small scale version of the, the overall theme of transition planning in terms of, you know, moving off of ARPA funds and into the general budget um, with the schools on the top of page five. So Andy, I'm kind of jumping back into the document for a minute because I'm just thinking about, you know, where where we are in our planning process and salaries that we're carrying on, you know, ESSER's school-based um, recovery funds, and you know, I I think it would be helpful to the certainly to the finance committee, if not the council, to understand what the school's transition planning um, looks like in terms of of you know recovery funded positions, you know, two or three years out, because that's something that we're all we're all doing, and of course, you know, we're doing it. We're looking at it from the overall town budget, but I think the school budget is going to have a lot of that. You know, we certainly do here, and it's worth it's worth us knowing about, so we can maybe just ask for that specifically. Okay. Um, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, I, I want to go back to pilots briefly, and that is that Sean. I can't remember in the document that you and Paul developed for Mindy and Joe, did we have pilots in that document? Um, no, because that document was more about if there's ever funding available. Um, for our town. Yeah, okay. for our town. And right. we, no, it, we didn't list legislative issues, but I think it is a good one that they should push for us. It, and my indication from talking with Mindy and Joe about pilots is that if we let them know we would like to see something like this then they would be more inclined to jump in so um it's an option okay so what i'll try and do it's going to be hard with thanksgiving coming up but we do have some time um but to try and get a uh, work on would, I guess, become draft four, if not higher. And um, then um, if I need to consult with individuals about sections that we've talked about today, or even send you sections or ask you to suggest language for sections, um, I might do that, but uh, I will move forward uh, as best we can to get this. I think there was a discussion that uh, something that Lynn asked me last night during the meeting, and I wanted to just touch on it, which was our original plan had been that this would be ready for the December 6th meeting uh, because that was the next meeting after the 15th when we planned this. And another meeting has now been uh, scheduled for the council on what is it, November 29. And uh, so, you know, she was asking me the question. And I was thinking no, but I did want to mention it. We didn't put it on the 29th. 
We did not. It's not on there right now. No, it is not. Because you asked me, do, were you thinking right. of putting it on the 29th? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's on it. the 6th. Yeah. It's we'll on leave the it on the 6th. And that will give us the ability to, um, when we talk about next meetings, come back um, and uh, see if we need an additional actual meeting for any purposes, including uh, to go over a final draft of this as a group, as opposed to um, leaving it in that vague status where I'm given the responsibility but we can't have the group process to approve it without a meeting. Um, otherwise, Athena will jump out of the screen and strangle me, so I wouldn't let that. Um, so I think that we're done with um, this piece for now, and uh, uh, Dorothy? Just a quick question, you said CRC was having a hearing on Monday, January 10th. Yep. They don't have meetings on Mondays. So what time of day is it on? I don't know, TSO. Wait, wait, or am I really getting mixed up now? I have been, am I, okay. I have been informed by the present chair of CRC that she would prefer that we not schedule a council meeting on December, on January 10th, because that is when she is scheduling now CRC's hearing of the solar moratorium. Yes, and now I recall that because I've actually talked with Mandy about that about because she and I've talked about solar moratorium for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, she has to schedule it because it has to be posted um, fairly far in advance. So mm -hmm. she's really scheduling for the next council Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that is why the pressure is on for the appointments to committees, uh, to the standing committees, uh, be made immediately after the third. Mm -hmm. Okay. Matt, I see your hand up. So I just want to clarify. So we, we are not meeting on the 30th, correct? Well, that's, I think, something that we have to talk about in a moment when we get to next meetings. Um, but um, where we're at right now, let's just go back to the agenda real quickly, uh, and then we'll come back to it. Uh, the performance show on Common, we left it that for the band shell that um, there was going to be an MOU develop or contract developed between the bid and the town and Sean and Gabriel are gonna uh, work on it. And I guess the question that we're gonna have to, and I think it's really Sean who has to tell us this as to how quickly that can happen because uh, if it's not uh, okay. gonna have, you know, if it's just the holidays are gonna drag it out then it needs to go into the transfer memo for the next uh, next finance committee meeting. Yeah, and, finance committee rather. And so, again, my thought is I didn't know if we should start working on that before the TSO does their piece, and then ultimately it's approved by the council. Um, I didn't know if we should start working on MOU before all those steps have happened first. So, assuming that we wait for those things to happen before we start spending time on that. Um, then it probably would be an issue that would carry over into the next year. Yeah, I had looked up the date and I don't have it the, in front of me now. And didn't TSO have a schedule on that one? Yeah, I think their hearing was on the 9th. Um, yeah. I, I don't know when that goes back to council to consider. That's correct. So it's a question of whether we um, want to say anything on on December 9th about that issue um, to th actually I have a. I think you could mention that an MOU will be developed. Um, I don't think it needs to be developed by that time because, again, that's I don't think the band shell is going to 
appear anytime super soon, but I think maybe one of the recommendations could be that the town manager execute an MOU or um, outlining how the maintenance of the band shell will be managed. I, and Paul and Andy, that's consistent with an agenda setting discussion we had just today, uh, because it's assumed that the band shell, well, this can't happen that way. I'm, I may be wrong. When the band shell comes up on the agenda, which I thought was on the 6th, but I guess it's not. Um, the, um, the motion is probably going to have something like, you know, requiring or asking the town manager to basically keep track of it. And, uh, to do that in a way that, and then he regularly updates the council because there's a lot of unknowns about the band shell, like sidewalks and stuff like that. And it's, you know, this is the kind of thing that the council should not spend their time on, uh, but we probably will want to hear about it. I'm, I'm looking at this. I'm going to tell you that I think the, um, yeah, the band shell, <clears throat> they are not having a public hearing on the band shell. They don't have to. Yeah, I, was mixing, I think I was mixing up the-, uh, the They are having a, yeah. they, are, they are debating it on December 2nd. Second. And from everything we can tell, both the design review board, the historic commission, and I think the, um, I always get the name wrong. Disability, Disability and Access Advisory Committee. Thank you. Um, so they believe that all their reports will be available on December 2nd. They then plan to actually make their recommendation on December 2nd. So it will be on the council's schedule for December 6th. Yeah, no, what I'm looking at right now is, uh, as you were talking, I um, pulled up the spreadsheet that um, TSO Chair Evan Ross yep. sent to the committee, because as I said earlier, that's the other committee I'm on. Right. And that is December 2nd, uh, that we make a recommendation to the council on both the outdoor performing arts venue, which is what he's calling it, in the town council public ways policy revisions. Um, and the public hearing that night is actually on an entirely different issue. And that's the um, street relocation and parking changes around Kendrick Park because of the new playground. And then uh, we have the other thing, which was the public forum that we previously talked about. Um, and that has to do with the addition, with the two new departments. And that's on December 9th, it's the public forum on the Crescent DEI right. office. Right. And so that's, when, that's when our committee uh, is asked if we have any comments to offer about the financial implications, which is why I think I sent every sent to the resident members the, um, the request from the manager because we do need to come back to that. So just to, to clarify, on November 29th, Athena, you can of you know chime in here i don't see anything that has is financial in nature but on december 6th um there is the bench the performance shell there is the discussion of the budget guidelines there's the discussion of the next round of discussion on the town manager's evaluation and then there's the second discussion on the town manager's goals.
It's also the state of the town address. So uh, if we, do we need an additional finance committee meeting? Um, because that's what we're really getting down to is uh, item six is next meetings. We're sort of flushing out what it is we need to have in next meeting in our discussions. Given the amount of things that we've talked about, should we schedule the next meeting and would it then be November 30th? There is a CRCC meeting scheduled for the 30th. Oh, that's right. That's right. We try and avoid that because Dorothy is, uh, does double duty. So can I get, and also trying to give you a little more time. Right. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. But if we're going to recommend on the shell, we have to have it to TSO by the second. Um, we don't really have to have a recommendation because I think that where we're sort of at is that we have already in uh, last night's meeting in the uh, report that Kathy wrote on behalf of our committee reported that um, our recommendation is that uh, an MOU or contract be negotiated between the town and Bid, and there was some specifications that were included in the discussion from the last meeting that you included, Kathy. And then, uh, um, so we really don't need to say much more about it than that because uh, it's not going to be negotiated probably in time for us to review it and present it to anyone. That's what I was going to. I, that was the point I was going to make, Andy, that we, I think Andy shared the report that we sent up, but I tried to capture our discussion about liability and some of the other issues we raised in that um, for what it, it should do. So we're not asking for the hard copy of it. We, we're asking for the um, sense of what should be in it. So I don't, I don't personally feel like we have to meet on that. And what I was going to ask on the this emerging draft, if we can each send you, I took notes um, on USB to draft this idea of bullets. So I, I will do that. And you can decide whether you like them or not. But I would be happy if, if we can all just send you our either line edits or added and that you take charge of that. I'd be happy not seeing the draft again rather than meeting this way uh, before the council meeting. Uh, you know, I, I think I both I trust you to honor what we send and everyone raised different issues. So if people send you the sentences and you show us a draft and we can independently not CC all, it's the way we did. Lynn, way back when we did the town manager goals that way, and you just, you know, we were all agreeing on the changes. So it's just a, what's the precise wording of them? I think we we kind of signed off on what we want done to the document. So, so that I, I, I think yeah. what Kathy, what you're suggesting is that if Andy took the report or you wrote this as vice chair, took the report you just wrote and you sent the section on the um, shell, performance shell. And on behalf of the finance committee, you sent that to Evan as the finance committee's deliberation, okay? That takes care of that item. So then the next item that you're discussing, and that is that we all send Andy our suggestions. By the way, he did send us a Word document. So if you wanna track changes, you can. And um, I just sent them to you, Andy. Um, so if we send them to Andy and not to anybody else, then we trust Andy to make the changes. And Andy, if you feel you have to send it back out for individual eyes, I believe you can do that, but we cannot ever reply all. Athena? 
Yes. Well, as long as you're not, as, go ahead, Tina. As long as you're not sharing those edits with a quorum outside a meeting, then you're good. So Andy's like he, like he described earlier, can contact individual members for input on sections as long as you're not sending all of those edits to the entire committee for feedback prior to a meeting. Why my my emails always say do not reply all in big bold letters. Yeah, and the other thing, um, and I'm just saying this out loud because I uh, to see if Athena agrees is that um, I cannot report if everybody in the end sends me an email that says, okay, this looks great now. I cannot report that because that would constitute a vote of the committee outside of the committee meeting. And uh, I have to take responsibility for the draft totally on my own. And I may have that knowledge, but I cannot report it. Right. You got it. So I think we just, so we're all clear that it's never going to say that it was approved by the entire committee because in fact it was not because it would have to be at an open meeting and we're not being able to schedule one. So the other thing then, so it seems like we're not gonna meet again till the seventh. The seventh is gonna be um, comments from the council that we need to consider for revisions to the uh, guidelines document. And then it'll go back to the council one last time. Um, but I want, um, that's what we've done in prior years. And uh, the other issue that will definitely be on the agenda is this transfer memo where we are um, suggesting to the next finance committee, of which three of you definitely will be members, um, what it is we envision is the uh, work assignments for the committee. Uh, and uh, then if Sean has progress on one of uh, any of three things, uh, it could be all three, but financial policies and objectives, uh, markup version of the final changes that you would like to see. And then we discuss those changes and what we do with it. So that was one. Um, the uh, we, oh, I know we definitely have to talk about the uh, financial implications of the two new departments. That was what I was going to say. Yeah, that has to come up. Um, whether there's going to be anything that he, uh, Sean, that you have further to tell us about ARPA and, uh, I think that was in the band shell uh, MOU if there's anything to report on that, but we're not necessarily expecting them, but if, then we would hear about it. So I think what we're saying is we're not meeting on the 30th, but we are meeting on December 7th. Correct. Okay. Thanks. I'll always take an extra day. Um, yeah, it's Dorothy who doesn't get the extra day because it's a CRC meeting. Right. That's why we can't do it. Uh, anyway, anything else that anybody has for today's meeting? Anything that uh, not anticipated other than the fact that I should have mentioned the uh, need for a transfer memo before, but that's not been handled. I just want to echo Lynn's opening statement, Andy. And a big thank you for this. I mean, you, you, what you, you gave us was so much of what we talked about last time that what I th saw, thought we were doing were refinements, some expansions. Um, so thank you for what clearly was um, a, a challenging well, task. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that. I hope that I uh, can live up to, to the same standard than in the next draft, which may be maybe tougher than you think. Okay, so um, with that, I guess I should declare the meeting adjourned and thank you very thank much. You. This has been a great discussion. I really appreciate everybody's uh, contributions. So thank Happy you. Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you all. Thanks.